Hey everybody, Joe Passion Unchained here. I have a special guest for you today, Ryan Christensen. He's a master hypnotist. He helps guys get out of their own way and get what they want in life, stop holding themselves back. I've worked with him personally. I asked him a lot of questions about how the mind works and I get a lot of tips and tricks about how to build a love life that you love in this interview, which I'm really excited about, and how to stop getting in your own way about a lot of things, business, love in general. Um, he offers a really cool insight I haven't heard before in the way that he shared it on the difference between attraction and comfort and what you need and why you need it. Um, so I'm really excited to share that with you. I do want to apologize. The audio sucks. Um, there was a lot of background noise. Uh, I... <laughs> Did not optimize the place. Um, I have not done an interview yet in this house, and the interview that I did was, um, the audio was very subpar. Uh, the place where it was was not a good place to do it. So I'm gonna have to figure out a better place to do interviews. I am very sorry about the audio quality, but I will say you can understand what both of us are saying. So that I'm grateful for, um, and I'm aware, just wanna let you know I'm aware of the quality of the audio, but it's good enough to listen to, just not amazing. Uh, looking forward to hearing what you have to say about him. This doesn't have to be the last time he's on. Uh, we know each other, he lives nearby. So um, if you want him on, uh, again, let me know what you want to learn from him and let me know what you got out of this interview. I'm looking forward to helping you guys out, build a life you love, and without further ado, here's the interview. Um, during the interview, I'll probably just go back to my phone every now and then to make sure it's still recording. I've had no a couple instances where it, it stopped. stopped, and <laughs> I now am paranoid as fuck about that. So, um, no worries at all. No worries cool. at all. So, um, welcome. If people don't know you, um, this is Ryan. Um, he has a website called Hypnosis for Men, and he hypnotizes men. And um, what what should people know about you right from the start? Uh, yeah, so I think my biggest thing, uh, like I said, I'm a master hypnotist. My job really is to help people have total freedom of action, right? So that they can do whatever they need to in life to live the life that they want to live. What I've found a lot of ways is that my biggest enemy, like almost always, is myself. Uh, the thing that has been the biggest factor in holding me back in life was always me and my own beliefs and my own baggage, my own trauma. Uh, and I feel like if people can get out of their own way, then everything becomes possible. Everything becomes possible much quicker than a lot of people think is even even possible, right? Mm -hmm. um, the, the kind of changes that I've seen in my own life doing this work, the kind of changes I've seen with my clients doing this work is kind of unbelievable um you know gary's been doing a lot of the interviews for me kind of getting some of the success stories from different clients and it's you know stories like oh yeah like i was antisocial for years and did a session and i had you know went out and did so much stuff that uh i got sick because i was going out about too much and just burned myself out <laughs> going out about being social I'm like all right that's a big change right um and i think it's for me you know having been through a lot in my own life and kind of had all those struggles, like I don't want anybody to have to be in any more pain and struggle any longer than they have to. Mm -hmm. And if there's a way to fix that stuff quick and if there's a way to get their stuff out of your way fast so that you can actually get on with living your life, like that's that's my goal. That's really my work. So you found that it works for you. Yes. And that you found it works for people and you're like, well, might as well just give it to as many people as I can. Yeah, well, I was working uh, intelligence for 16 years or so in D.C. You know, I was working in the Marine Corps, the Air National Guard before that. So for 23 years, I was in the intelligence community uh, doing counterterrorism, counterproliferation, military stuff. And I was kind of reaching the point where I didn't get to do the fun stuff anymore. I was doing more like project management, and, like customer relations stuff and like massaging egos, which is not customer my Customer relations? Who's, who's the customer? Well, like, you know, the different kind of people that you have to work with, the different organizations and stuff like sure. that, um, different partners that these organizations have. Just kind of managing those relationships uh, on different projects. And, but I didn't get to go around playing like International Man of Mystery anymore and mm -hmm. do the fun stuff. So it's like, well, this is getting kind of boring. And I was looking to figure out what I wanted to do next. At about that same time, I was getting in the red pill space, uh, trying to figure stuff out after my second divorce, trying to figure out how to do um, you know, dating and stuff. Go ahead, by all means. Yeah, go ahead. We can edit. It's all good. <laughs> <laughs> no worries, man. Appreciate it. But yeah, so I was doing all this work trying to figure out how to get back in the dating scene after being divorced a second time and started doing a bunch of self-improvement work there. 
uh, working in communities like Richard Cooper, Ryan Stone, uh, John from Modern Life Dating was very instrumental for me. Mm. And I actually just, partner a lot on yeah, we do these the days. Show. Yeah. Um, but you know, at the end of 2019, I was just getting into that space and, and start learning from him and his guys. Uh, one of the guys there was, a, was a hypnotist, did some work with him, just kind of cleared out a bunch of emotional baggage, just created a bunch of space for me to do some more stuff. I'm like, well, that's interesting. It mm-hmm. seemed a heck of a lot more interesting than trying to get a, uh, a master's or a PhD in psychology to become a psychologist. Mm. Cause that's gonna be like six years, like three, yeah. 400, 500 grand. It's like, I wouldn't get started until I'm 50. It's like, that's unappealing. I have to work in the job that I don't like until that got the start, right? Mm-hmm. So ended up exploring hypnosis, got certified as a hypnotist back in February of 22, right before everything went to shit. Nice. Um, and so at the beginning of the pandemic, I got to do some work with guys uh, just through the very different communities. Found out I was actually able to get some results for it. So I was like, all right, let's play with this some more. Got some more training, launched Hypnosis for Men in May of 2020. Mm-hmm. Uh, by the time October rolled around, it's like I can't do both anymore. Mm-hmm. And so I left my old career and I do this full time now. Nice. So it all happened super quick then. Very, very quickly. Very, very quickly. That's one thing that's been kind of a constant in my life is that when I realize something, when something really clicks for me, like I know like this is the thing that has to be done, there's like no hesitations. Like, well, mm-hmm. we're doing this. You have to do I, it. Yeah. You have to do it. Have you don't mind do going and taking the leaps? No, no. I think that's one of the things that's been, that's served me very well is that once I know something needs to be done, I go all in on it. You know, so once nice. I realized that my dating life wasn't, Working the way I needed to, I need yeah. to change that. All in the red pill, all in the spill for improvement space. You know, working with coaches and everybody else to like, you know, unfuck my mind to get my body in shape, mm-hmm. get my style on point, figure out this whole game thing. You know, figure out how to do dating, figure out how to do Tinder because I never had to do that before. <laughs> Very weird to do in your mid forties. Yeah. I have a lot of clients DC. Are, like they just got into a divorce, uh, through a divorce. They've never been on the dating apps because they've been married for like 10, 20 years. Exactly, exactly. And the game changes so much. I think yeah. the last time I really had a date in the normal scene was like in high school. And that was like 20 <laughs> something years ago. That was a long, long time, time ago. ago. <laughs> so just the game changes so much. Uh, but one of the things that, that has been very true in my life is that when I see something needs to be done and I go hard, it, I tend to get results pretty quick. Nice. Because I'm going to tend to just throw myself just into it. it. Just do yeah. it. You know, whatever it happens to be, just do the thing, right? Mm-hmm. Getting to that point can be very difficult. <laughs> I tend to be on the ADHD side, so forcing myself to do stuff on a regular mm. basis isn't, isn't very easy. But when it begins, you know, hits that threshold where it's like, it's just like, this has to be done. There's Man, like no other be. option. Then I flip that switch and I'm at. That makes a lot of sense. I notice that there are times where um, something is an issue for me. Like maybe yep. maybe I haven't been getting sales in like three weeks. Right. Right? And, you know, every now and then, well, usually at three weeks, it's kind of out of, even like a week though, even if I haven't gotten a shoot in a week, it's like, oh damn, I need to do something. And yes. so I'll just post, 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 post. And then I'll get like three calls and they all book. And I'm like, yes. Yes. And like with girls, it's like, there's sometimes where I'm just really lonely where I'll just have a, a night where I'm just like, ugh. And then I find that Consi- I kind of like those nights now, right? Because I found that without fail, every single time I feel that lonely to where I'm motivated, like within days, I find a really awesome girl. That exactly. at least, if not, if she's not my main girl, she's like some, you know, cl- some somebody in my rotation. I'm sure. Like, I just find it like that because I'm so motivated. Yeah. Well, and I think that there's a certain a, a pain point where, like, how to put it. If you look at like fight and flight responses, right? Um, people go through a lot of stuff and they kind of go down one of those two roads, but not necessarily flight or freeze. That was kind of my response. Yeah, there's like three like, fight, flight, and freeze, and not everyone talks uh, about And the then, freeze. well, there's actually five. five fight, flight, freeze, fawn, which is where you're like trying to like um, butter somebody up and flatter them and stuff to take I care of yourself, a right? Do that a lot. <laughs> I do that yeah, a lot. lot of people do. Yeah. Uh, the other one is fuck, but that's only, that's exclusively a female strategy. It's okay. like if I. Yeah, because you, like you get, or, or like a guy who likes, like a maybe like a sure. skinny twink or like that. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. Big brawny man. Yeah, but if you're in a situation where the person you're with is like aggressive and violent and you can get them off, then all of a sudden that aggression goes down significantly. True, so true, it's true, a, true. It's a, it is a survival strategy. It's not yeah, what we talk sense. about. But sense. the two big ones I kind of see really are the fight response or the freeze response, where if you got low self esteem or if there's shit going on, either you go down this road where you just like go hard on everything. Mm-hmm. which is what a lot of entrepreneurs do. They're yep. kind of like running from the insecurity by being incredibly productive, or you go down the freeze response and like, screw it, I'm not doing anything, right? But even in that space, if things get hard enough, if you get enough, like you flip that switch, because mm-hmm. you gotta, you can't let yourself like completely fail. 
Yeah. So that survival response says, okay, it's bad enough. I have to do something. I can't be in freeze mode anymore. So we flip over the fight response and mm. just get start hammering stuff. Which is good for a short period of time. Good you for a short period of time. Too long, it's like, well, now you're Grant Cardone and get like a heart attack in two years or whatever. Exactly. Exactly. No, no offense Has to this, Grant, but like it's it, definitely always in fighting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And and that's just the way some of those guys, you know, that's the that's the strategy that's worked for them. So yeah. that they're just going sure. down that road. And, and usually it you works. find people, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. Yeah, go for it. Usually you find people that, um, like they've been poor their whole lives and that's their motivation and they hold on to that motivation and they never let that go. And so they're always, in fun. they're always acting like they're poor and that even gets if them they're rich. Exactly. Yeah. And so the, 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 the downside of that is that even when you're successful, it doesn't actually change anything about who you feel you are, who you think you are. So you're still acting poor, even if you're rich mm. and you, you never actually change your self image based on your success. It doesn't actually prove anything to you. Mm. And so you're always running down that road anyway. So that's, that's the downside of that one. Downside of the freeze response, of course, is that you never really do anything. You're kind of stuck in a cage, right? Mm -hmm. Until things become bad enough that it's necessary for you to do something to make sure you don't fall out mm -hmm. you know, on the downside. Um, and for me, especially, it got to this point where I kind of like used to love the chaos, mm -hmm. right? Because if, yeah. everything, if everything's a chaos, if everything's on fire, if everything's an emergency, <laughs> then yeah. I have to do something so yeah. I get to put yeah. that switch on, right? 100%. And you get to feel alive, get to yeah. feel like you're doing stuff and it feels phenomenal because you're actually taking action mm. when you normally can't. So I found myself often in a lot of ways back in the day, you know, like letting things get bad enough until <laughs> it becomes an emergency so I could flip that switch yeah. so I could feel that like being, you know, that feeling on. Um, you were like getting in your, not even getting in your own way, like you thought you were helping yourself. Yeah, by creating chaos. By creating chaos. Yes. Because then it's like, well, I, I, get, I feel excited to do things now. I don't feel, I feel like alive. I alive. Yeah, you feel alive, and that's that's an amazing feeling. Mm. Um, it's incredibly toxic and self destructive <laughs> way to feel yeah. alive, but at least you feel alive, right? And when you don't feel that on a day to day basis, that's a pretty addictive, pretty uh, intoxicating thing. Sure. And one thing that I found is that as I've done the work on myself and as I've cleared stuff out, like it's not necessary anymore mm. for me to be in that chaotic state and let things get that bad for me to take action. It's like okay, I don't have to be in freeze response anymore, so I can take action when I choose. Mm. And I can do so in a much more relaxed way. You feel motivated by desire rather than fear. So exactly. Much. Exactly. That was something it's, that came yeah. up after our last session. Um, I don't remember. I think it wasn't even, I think it was more related to the second to last session mm -hmm. or something, but I, I, all of them are kind of like melding together. <laughs> melding together yep. But there was a moment where I, I just started realizing, I just noticed like every single day there was like, there is this feeling of like lack. And instead of trying to run from it, I'm like, ah, that's there. And I wasn't even meditating more than usual. In fact, right. I was meditating less than usual. Yep. But I feel like, like in our sessions, it I've worked with him uh, uh, the, a couple times, yeah, uh, a couple few times. <laughs> in our sessions, we kind of like opened up that, like, oh, okay, cool. You don't really. It's okay. As I think it was, it was the last session because yep. it was about money. Where I was like, I realized that I was, um, I was. Uh, always in a survival mode around um, around not just money. Money was like more of a symbol for me being afraid of yes. life going crazy. And so I was like, there's this feeling of like angst in me and I'm like, you know what? What if I don't have to run from this? What if I just let it be there? Mm -hmm. And then it was there. And then now like my actions, it does that, that feeling of anxiety no longer influences my actions. It's right. no longer the director. It's no longer in the captain seat. Hundred percent. Like if you're watching inside out with like the fear and like yes. the anger, it's like the fear's there and it's an advisor. Like the fear is like the the, the really nervous advisor to the king. Yes. It's like, well there's the king and then there's the and you're you're the king, but if you let the if you're like a passive king that just lets the fear take over, well then you're gonna It runs your life. It yeah. runs your life. The fear should be an advisor. Yes. It shouldn't be cast out. That's also not the, not the solution because you need right. to be warned of things. Sometimes. Exactly. Exactly. Fear is a tool and it can be a very powerful tool to say, hey, pay attention to this so it doesn't bite you in the ass. Yeah. Right. It's like this thing's coming down the pipe. Perhaps you should get out of the way. Right. right. If there's a train coming down the tracks, maybe you don't want to be on the tracks when it arrives. Just a thought. Maybe. Right. <laughs> Just maybe so. Like, it's up to you. If you want to stay, it's, your, it's on you. But like in general, I advise not being on the tracks when the train yeah. comes by. Right. But you don't have to be it's like, oh, my God, there's train tracks. There's possibly a train. It's like, oh, my God, I could never go across this. Like, I'm yeah. It's like you don't have to do that. You don't have to do that. And once mm. you're not in survival mode, what happens is those signals that you're getting, the fear responses and the anxiety and mm. stuff tend to be more clear and actually responsive to real threats in the environment. Mm. Yeah. Rather than a response to your own insecurities and doubts and fears in the past trauma. Mm -hmm. Right. 
to where you can actually judge situations more clearly and react more clearly in a, in a more productive way. Yeah. Right? And you can actually see stuff coming down the pipe and not freak the fuck out about it and say, okay, cool. Uh, this thing's coming down the pipe. I need to deal with it in the next couple of weeks, mm -hmm. but I don't have to do it right now. Mm -hmm. And one of the biggest things that that does is it creates space for you to be patient. You can actually be patient and say, okay, cool. I have to do this thing. It doesn't have to be done right now, which allows you the time and space to think bigger. Yeah. One of the biggest we just things about this right before we start. Yeah, yeah. One of the biggest things about being in survival mode is that if you're in survival mode, your horizon is like today and tomorrow. Mm -hmm. like, that's yeah. it. Yeah. That's your, that's the only sort of things you can commit, consider is like what's happening right now, what's gonna hit me in the face tomorrow, what's coming down the track that's gonna hit me in the face today after that, right? That's all you're really thinking about. And if that's the, the place you're in, you're just totally playing defense and just trying to get through your day, then there's no time to like kind of pick your head up and look out in the horizon. It's like, okay, what's possible? Mm -hmm. Like where do I actually want to go? What do I actually want to create? What's possible for me to create over the next year or three years or five years or a decade, right? I never thought that I'd be in the position I am with the business I am whenever I started, like that was not even a thing. And once it became clear that this is what I need to do full time, even what I'm doing now isn't really a thing. It wasn't really a thing, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, let's just do individual sessions. It's like, no, let's solve problems. Mm -hmm. You know, that shift happened at the beginning of the year and I like that model so much better mm -hmm. and from here because oh, yeah, because you have a unique setup like i yeah. i actually uh i didn't say this but i kind of felt guilty whenever i asked for a session because like, <laughs> the, the way you do things is just yeah the way that uh ryan does things is he will be like cool so what are your problems all right these are the problems we're going to solve them in as many sessions as it takes right and so and you originally said that you, you think it would be about three. So in my mm. mind, I'm like, okay, I'm gonna do three sessions. Like I'm thinking like three sessions. And then when the when I wanted a fourth one, I was like, oh, like I want to pay you for this. It's and like, you're that's like, that's not the deal. It's yeah, not the deal. but like in my mind, I'm like, I don't want. I felt like I was wasting your time or right, something. Right. Well, here's the thing: is like, there's a difference between like time based pricing and value based pricing. Yeah. Right. And value based pricing is a very different model. Most people don't do it in a business world, right? Uh, you'll see this sometimes in consulting where it's like, okay, you walk into a company, a company's got a million dollar problem. It's like, cool, you have a million dollar problem. It's going to, it's going to get you a million dollars. If mm -hmm. I solve this problem for you, I'll charge you 250,000 and you'll pay that all day. Cause if I can yeah. fix it, you get a million, yeah. quarter million to get a million, do that all day long. Right. Doing that in the self-improvement space is actually kind of difficult. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, because a lot of people can't guarantee results there. It's not quite so it's not like, okay, you join my dating course and I guarantee you're going to get laid next yeah. week. It's like, that's not, that doesn't happen. Right. Yeah, Cause there's so many variables, so many variables and everything else. Right. Um, but what I've found in the work that I've done is that if we scope the problems, right, then, and you're willing to do the work, you're doing it in good faith, then yeah, I'm going to get you free of that problem. Mm -hmm. I don't know what you're going to look like on the other side. I don't yeah. know what your life is going to look like. I don't, I don't, I'm not here to tell you who you should be. But, but I can't internal, guarantee you, you can guarantee that this thing's not changes. in the way. Yeah. yeah, like this thing's not going to be in the way. Yeah, like I'm, right. I'm no longer like, like I'm, I'm to the point now where I'm like, well, let me like, not freak out when when I don't get sales in a week, which right. isn't that uncommon. Like I mean, yeah. I get I get more than enough to sustain myself and, and live happily. Like sometimes I get like a ton in a week, but every now and then I'll get a week here and there that's like, oh, you know, no sales and sure. no calls, and I'm like, well, what's going on? In the past, I'd be like, oh, freak out, like do a bunch of random shit. And like Alex, Alex Ramosi would, would talk about this. He'd be like, you got to be patient because the moment you're like, some people, they feel like they're doing a lot, but they're just going in a bunch of random directions. And that was 100% yes. me. Yes. And so like after that, I don't remember, I think it was the last, uh, one of the sessions, yeah. after one of the sessions, it wasn't like all of a sudden I got a ton of business, but it was like all of a sudden I'm not in my own way and yeah. I'm not the reason. It's like, I still have to do the work. Yes. I still have to do... I mean, I'm, I'm in a good place, but like I still have to do the work to get in a better place. It's not like mm -hmm. magically the universe gives me what I want, but it's like magically I'm not the problem anymore. I'm not right. the one getting in the, <laughs> my own way. Yes. And that's like, once you're not the one getting in your own way, like all your efforts, like the actually, your efforts actually pay off. Yes. And if they don't, then you actually learn from your mistakes. You're not just randomly doing things yes. to feel busy. And actually, this is a really good point because one of the things that, you know, up until I started doing this, like I had never run a business in my life. Like I've been <laughs> yeah. in the military, I've been doing like, you know, basically got my contracting. Sure. So I'd never had to do anything like marketing or contracts or any of that stuff or finance. That never had to do any of that stuff. So it's been an evolution for me trying to like do all this stuff. And one of the things about me is that I've always been like the guy on the outside looking in, like I'm going to be the guy like I don't I'm, I'm working in the shadows like you don't know me. Mm -hmm. which is really bad when you need to market and that yeah. know you. <laughs> so that's been a big shift for me. And so like client flow for me is a, is a problem I'm still working to solve, right? I don't have a consistent flow. I can't count on like, 
I don't know how many clients I'm going to have this month. Mm-hmm. I got no idea. I'm getting some consistency. I'm getting I'm some consistency. Starting cons- to yeah. get some consistency now, but like I, I totally know what you're saying. Okay? Yeah. Feels so going from a world where I've yeah. always got this paycheck, mm-hmm. right, and I'm making a good salary, mm-hmm. I know what I'm going to sit. You know, my paycheck's going to be six months to now to like not having an idea like how many clients I'm going to have this month. Yeah. Big shift. Big oh, yeah. shift. And so, yeah. like for a long time, for all this year, I've just been freaking the hell out, like trying to figure out like what am I supposed to do, what am I supposed to do, what am I supposed to do, and then not doing anything about it, of course. <laughs> Yeah. Um, to it's like no it's okay you know what this is gonna like it's gonna happen it's gonna be fine like I know over the next three months I'm gonna get enough people in the in the door to pay the bills like it's mm-hmm. fine right this thing's gonna happen this thing's gonna happen I get a couple of clients this way every month anyway so mm-hmm. let me take a step back and figure out actually what I want things to look like mm-hmm. and then do the deliberate work to create that mm-hmm. as opposed to running around freaking out trying to solve this small problem in the, in the near term it's like no if I build the thing that I want to have mm-hmm. if I actually set the foundation and build the structure and build the processes to support that, then this little shit's gonna solve itself in the meantime, Mm -hmm. right? This is gonna take care of itself. This is a solved problem as long as I do this other thing. Mm -hmm. But it means taking your eye off the immediate problem to Mm -hmm. look at what you need to do three months, six months, a year from now and setting up things so that that process runs smooth and is going to produce those results over that year. Mm -hmm. And that's not something you can do if you're in survival mode. Yeah. If you're freaking the hell out about the day-to-day, you can't do that. But if you do that, that you never have to worry about the day-to-day stuff again, mm-hmm. right? It's building that long-term success, it's building that long-term process and that foundation that's going to deliver you for you for months and years to come, rather than worrying about where's my next meal coming from, mm. right? But that's hard to do when you're in survival mode. Yeah, You just flat out can't because you're freaking the hell out about where the heck is my next meal going to come from, whether that's business one, whether that's food, whether that's relationships, whatever that happens to be, Mm -hmm. right? And when you're freaking out about that, you can't do that longer term planning. So you end up just spinning your wheels on the short term stuff and never actually going anywhere, Mm -hmm. which sucks, especially for guys who have a lot of potential. A lot of people in this space, they've got a lot of potential. They're just in their own way so bad that they can't actually, you know, not actualize, but like realize that potential, you know? Mm-hmm. If you look at like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, that old psychology principle, like, you know, food, shelter, and then you got like sex and like belonging, like most guys in the space are still working on those first two. They're nowhere yeah. near working on those higher levels, right? But once you start taking off your ball, it's like, okay, you know, take your eye off those lower levels and start looking at that higher stuff of like trying to bring yourself up that pyramid, mm-hmm. moving up those hierarchy of needs to where you're looking at things like, you know, more adding value to the world and looking at self-actualization and actually clearing out your own stuff, the bottom stuff kind of takes care of itself in a lot of ways mm. because you already know how to solve those problems. You're just so fixated on them that you're not solving bigger problems. Mm. So if you focus on the bigger problems, the smaller problems kind of take care of themselves. Interesting. I hope that makes sense. Because you're trying to find problems to solve and if you're not focusing on what their actual problems, you're going to make them. Yes. In a lot of ways, yeah. In a lot of ways, yeah. So you end up freaking out about stuff that's not actually a problem yet. Yeah. It's like, oh my God, like, I don't know how to pay my rent in January of next year <laughs> and it's October. I've got to solve this problem right now. It's like, no, you've got 90 days. Yeah. <laughs> in the next 90 days, you're going to figure out how to pay your rent in January. It's fine. Yeah. Right? No, that's a really good way to say it because um, there's uh, recently I was looking at my income and I'm like, if I get zero sales whatsoever in October, then I only have like this amount of months left in my savings. I'm just like, is but that you actually? have you gotta get sales in October. <laughs> exactly. What are you feeling? So exactly. I'm, I'm always like, like, my, I'm like in in my, my fear part of the brain is like, well, what if what if the worst thing happens? And like, I think there is something to be said yes. for like looking at that and be like, yep. well, be prepared for that. Make sure you can handle that. But it's all it's also like, if the answer is like, I don't really know how to handle that. Like, it still might not be the best thing to focus all your effort on that. Like, right. Focusing all your like, and that's another thing. It's like going from fear to desire. It's like. It's going from trying to hedge against the worst problems possible to like, well, what do I actually want to build? Yeah. And when you, when you're like, if, if I, like when I'm making money, going broke is not a problem. Yes. But if I'm focusing on not going broke, I won't necessarily, I probably won't be making as much money as I can. Yeah. And that's a, that's a really good point. One of the things that I realize is. If all of your attention is focused on preventing bad things from happening, mm. none of your attention is focused on how to make the good things happen, yeah. right? If all you're focusing on is like how to prevent somebody from like ghosting you on your dating apps and mm-hmm. like, you know, being an incel and all this yeah. sort of stuff that you're not actually focused on, okay, so what happens if she actually likes me? 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like yeah. I have plans for all 870 things that can go wrong, but if things go right, I don't know what I'm going to do. It's like, yeah. maybe I should spend some time here. That's one of my biggest criticisms because right. I feel like a lot of the people in the, um, in, like, the dating space yep. are, how do I not get rejected? But why does it matter if you get rejected? Like, well, there's, there's a lot of reasons why that matters. And I think one of the biggest ones is if you're coming into the space with low self-esteem, mm. which a lot of people are, right? Because things are not working. They're not yeah. doing what they do. And it's just like, I definitely was definitely in that space, right? Same. Things were not working for me. Then every rejection you have, every time things don't work, that's a confirmation of the fact that you're not good enough, mm-hmm. that things are not working, that you don't have to figure it out. And it's going to get you in that, it can easily get you in that doom loop where you're like, oh my God, I'm never going to figure this out. I'm always going to be this way. I'm screwed. Mm. Right? So trying to prevent the worst possible thing from happening in order to not confirm to yourself how bad you are is actually not necessarily the worst use of your okay. time. Right? It's not. Now, I, I would from. think that perhaps if you fix your low self-esteem so you can actually go do the thing you want to do, that's probably the better solution. That's definitely mm-hmm. worked a lot more for me. But in a lot of ways, if you can just get these guys a couple of good wins, mm-hmm. then they start looking and say, okay, how do I get more wins and more wins mm-hmm. and more wins? And they start focusing on how to create those wins, right? But they have to understand how to play defense first mm-hmm. to protect themselves, protect their, their ego, protect you know their self-esteem and everything mm-hmm. else. They have to kind of play defense. They have to figure out how to handle that situation so that they can stack up those wins. Yeah, I, I, I hear you where you're coming from. I think there is a place to be said for how to not get rejected. I also feel like it's important because, like, the, 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 the problem I see sometimes is people get so caught up in how do I be the guy that never gets rejected Yeah. that they change who they are. Yes. And they become kind of manipulative. Well, I don't know if necessarily... There's nothing wrong with manipulation to an extent, but because like, hypnosis is all manipulation. But yeah, to I a prefer. point where like you're not like... You're not, you, all you are is a reaction to her rather than like... Yeah, so I think that... I'm talking about. If you take away like the manipulation piece, let's go ahead and take that off the table for just yeah. a minute because I think it gets... You get... Uh, it muddles the conversation. Yeah, I yeah. think if you're always trying to figure out who you have to be in order for a certain person to like you, mm-hmm. then you're always playing a role. That's that's what I was. You're thinking. always playing a role, right? You're always say. faking it, mm-hmm. and if you're always faking it, you can never actually make it. Yep. Right. And oh, by the way, if you're always faking it, then they're never actually accepting or rejecting you as a yes. person who you are because you're not actually showing them who you are, which is part of why that doesn't really work to solve your self-esteem issues because mm-hmm. it's like, oh, she only accepted me. She only mm-hmm. you know went back home with me because I was playing like super chad popping bottles in the club. Yeah. So I can't actually show her who I am. Because she expects me to be super chad popping bottles in the club. Mm-hmm. So I can't be anything other than super chad pop- can't bottles be in the club. Likes to sit home and read books. Yeah, I can't be, you can't be that. You're not allowed to be that. Yeah. Because that doesn't get you what you want. That's you have to be this other thing. That's not who she thought you were. Exactly. Exactly. So you end up like turning yourself into a pretzel trying to be something you're not in mm-hmm. order to get this reward. And when you get the reward, you don't even get to freaking enjoy it because yep. it's not based on who you are. Yeah, that's exactly so it doesn't what solve was, that problem. That yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's, and that's a very big, that's a very big issue in the space and I think that I'm not entirely sure how to solve that mm-hmm. um, I think it's very individual I think that having more models of guys who go about game different ways and still mm-hmm. get success will help mm-hmm. because the most popular ones are guys who are like really flamboyant really outgoing mm-hmm. um, who are the guys who are popping bottles driving Lambos pop you know got the yacht parties that kind of stuff right mm-hmm. um, and so it kind of you know the mystery kind of thing right you know you got it over the top right and I think that it gives guys the impression like that's the only way that you can have success, right? So having more guys out there that are more smooth and suave and laid back, they're hanging out at a, a lounge, right? Or they're doing freaking game in a library or in the coffee shop and stuff like that. And having more good examples like that would make it easier for guys to realize there's more than one archetype that they can follow. I like that, yeah. Yeah, I see where you Which makes from. it that they can choose the archetype that's actually closer to what's natural for them. Mm-hmm. And find a way to make that archetype and who they are actually succeed. Because yeah. ultimately, like if you're going to be doing anything more than just like one night stands or anything more than a couple of dates, like your who you are, who you actually are, is going to come out. Mm-hmm. And if they're attracted to a fake version of you, then whenever the real you comes out, that's going to cause a lot of problems. But if you're walking into the situation saying, "Yep, this is who I am. Mm. This is what I'm all about," from the beginning then you don't have to worry about whether or not she's going to see the real you because you've shown her that from the beginning. 
Mm. And she's with you because you've shown who you actually are. Right? Now, do you want to show them the best version of yourself? Absolutely. There's the product, the market, and the marketing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Have good marketing. Yes. <laughs> but sell the actual product that you're you actually trying just, to sell. Like, wear a ripped up shirt. And, exactly. You know, yeah. Stains, not wash yourself. Exactly. Exactly. You got to have the marketing. Like, portray yourself in the best possible mm -hmm. way, but portray you. Mm -hmm. Right? If I'm trying to sell you a Lamborghini, you say, outstanding, I'd love to buy this Lamborghini, and I show up and here's a Fiat, like, you're going to be pissed. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> right? But there's some people who fucking like Fiats. They can be a lot of fun. You got a little Mini Cooper? Those things are a blast. Sure. I'm never going to drive one. You're never going to sell one to the cowboy on the ranch who needs a truck to drive his freaking, you know, dually truck to drive his, you know, haul around his horse trailer. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of people that like Mini Coopers. So you don't actually have to try and pretend to be the four-ton truck. You have to be to pretend to be a Lamborghini, mm -hmm. even though those, those sell a lot. You just need to find a way to sell who you are yep. to the audience you want to sell it to. 100%. Right? Um, there's a, um, this sec it's actually a stolen version, but... Sure. Second girl I made out with, um, easily one of the more most attractive girls I've made out with. I met yeah. with a lot of girls, um, but that was like one of the top five. Maybe. Yep. So she was amazing. No, yes, maybe top ten. She was amazing. Yeah. Um, I was in Israel and I was on birthright, and after birthright, I got a week to myself mm -hmm. just to do what I want. I mean, I could I could have gone hard along, but I decided to go to a week because I had to go to university. Sure. After that. And um, I like to say share this story because. Nobody in their right mind would have told me to do what I did, but it was who I was. Right. I I went to the hostel where she worked, and I was and I looked at all the hostels because um, everyone else had gone back to America. Sure. And I had stayed with our caravan guard, who is like a dude who says she protected us during the trip for a night, and the mm -hmm. next day I found a hostel. And um, this hostel had a sexy ass receptionist, and she was so <laughs> fucking hot. So I'm like, I'm gonna pick that one. I'm gonna flirt with her and hope something happens. <laughs> And I did. Yep. And she, like, after like a couple days, she just invited me out to go places because I was like showing interest in her. Like, obviously, she could tell I was interested. And she just like we just had an awesome fling for that week. Yeah. Um, and there was one time because I was going through a lot of shit, uh, a lot of shit about my childhood. I was like, that was right at the time where I started to wake up from a lot of the abuse that that had happened in my childhood mm -hmm. and realize what was happening. So I was really, really in it. And I was like, there's a lot of turmoil under the surface. And we were at a bookstore, uh, bookstore slash cafe in the right. of Tel Aviv. And um, we just started talking. She had gone through a lot of shit, too. And we were just started talking about it. And I just broke down and cried and just, like, started crying about my past. And she, like, she, like laid on her, 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 her lap and she just stroked my hair. And she, like, that made her feel a lot closer to me. Yeah. And nobody in the right fuck, like, no, you're not going to hear any pickup artist be like, no. you should break down and cry in front of the girl. It's like... Yeah. Zero people are going to tell you to do that, and if it's not 100% genuine, it's a bad idea. And even if it is, like, you probably should. <laughs> I wouldn't necessarily suggest that unless, like, somebody's, like, your girlfriend or something. Right, but right. For me, in that moment, it was what happened because I was going through a lot of shit, and it helped. Like, that That was, like, one of the things I bring up when I, when I like, it's important to not pretend so much. Yeah. Well, I think that one of the big things from, that I've learned from the Red Pill that's not obvious, um in the pickup space or pretty much any other space is that there's a difference between attraction and comfort. Mm, yes, yes. Right? Very much so. People talk about alpha, beta, and it gets into this whole like, oh, alpha's good and beta's bad. It's mm -hmm. like, that's not really it. You need both attraction and comfort mm -hmm. in order to maintain a relationship. Mm -hmm. But too many guys were trying to create attraction by building comfort, yeah. which doesn't freaking work, yep. right? But if you're all attraction, if you're all alpha, all like badass and aloof and everything else, then a lot of times they don't feel safe enough mm -hmm. to yep. let down the guard and let you in. Yes. So you have to have that balance and obviously weigh things heavily on the attraction side to begin with because you need their attraction in order to yes. get anywhere. But showing some vulnerability actually creates a lot of comfort and that can be the thing that they need to allow themselves mm -hmm. to act on the attraction that they feel. If you're, yeah, so uh, if you're the fuck boy that has a soft side, it's oh, yeah. amazing. That's if you're crack. Like, oh, that's total crack. Exactly. So, <laughs> that's that, total so crack. it's the, you have to be the fuck boy that has the soft side. Yes. And it's the soft side you're talking about here. Yeah. And the soft yeah. side could be like up to maybe a quarter or a third of what you are. Depending, you shouldn't be, yeah. I, I definitely agree, you shouldn't be over 50%. Over oh, no, comfort. no, you can't. And I think that when it comes to creating attraction and actually getting somebody into a relationship, you have to go heavy on the attraction side and yeah. light on the comfort side. Um, when you're talking about maintaining long-term relationships, you need to add more comfort. Yeah. Like, you cannot maintain a relationship past a couple of months based on attraction alone. 
It just doesn't freaking work. Um, you will you will lose them. Or if you can, probably not somebody you want to be with. Yeah. <laughs> probably not somebody you want to you be with. You have to right? keep upping the ante. Yes, and that just and that and that's that's not a game you want to play, right? Yeah. You essentially you're turning yourself into a carnival ride or a music cart ride. It's like I do not want to have to play roller coaster for somebody just to yeah. be amusing enough for them to stick around. Like that's I'm not really going to play that game. It's like, yeah, so just done. so concise. Well, I used to be in the yeah, I used to be in the BDSM scene for a number of years, and used to be. yeah, I still do a little bit of play, but I'm not really in the scene, right? I'm not okay, really in the public gotcha. scene, right? Um, and a lot of these different parties and events that I would go to, like I was known for for doing a couple specific things. Mm-hmm. I had a couple specialties I was really good at, and after in the beginning it was like oh man i'm getting all this attention because i've got all these girls coming up wanting to play with me and like taking off the clothes and letting me do these filthy dirty things to them it's awesome and after a while i realized it's like wait they're all coming here for the amusement park ride and then they're leaving to go somewhere else Mm -hmm. and it's like that's not what i'm signing up for that's not what i'm signing up for i'm not here to be your fun time to get your little hit Mm -hmm. your dopamine hit and your adrenaline hit and then you go off so it's like that's no i'm not an amusement park ride i'm not going to allow myself to be used for your amusement just because I have this really cool skill that I have, right? Mm-hmm. So realizing that that dynamic was a play and then realizing that kind of dynamic is in play in kind of dating in general really kind of shifted my attitude to like what I'm going to do, right? So for me, when I was in the dating scene much more heavily, you know, it's much more like, oh, great, we're going to go out for drinks. You know, maybe we'll go see a show or something like that. But until I've invested in you, until you've invested in me, I'm not actually going and doing really cool shit with you. Yeah. Right. Like you don't want that to be the reason she comes to you because then yes. in your mind she'd be like, oh, like I'm gonna go to this guy when I want to hit, not I want to be with this guy and right. like actually like yeah. be loyal to him. I'm gonna just check. Sure, go for it. Just to make sure. Cool. Just like... Awesome. Just for the people watching, uh, you're gonna see a little cuts here and there. Um, if you've been with me for a while, you notice that every now and then when I do an interview, there are issues, um, and so. <laughs> In the past year, there haven't been any issues, but it's because I've started to become very paranoid to make sure that everything is recording at all moments. Yes. <laughs> so um, I'm making sure everything is recording at all moments. And I'm going to stop here and there to just check on the audio and the video. So um, cool. We're, we're back. Awesome. So one thing that I would say is like, I don't mind somebody coming to me to get their hit, mm-hmm. as long as it's something that I'm going to enjoy as well. Yeah. Right. As long as it's what you want. You yeah, yeah. Want. Like it's like if you're coming over because you know you want to call me daddy and I'm gonna do filthy dirty things to you, I am all about that. By yeah. all means, come over. I'll take care of you, baby girl. It's all good, right? Yeah. If you want me to take you out to dinner over and over and over again to these high end restaurants and go yeah. out to these shows, it's like no, I'm sorry, I'm not that guy. Mm-hmm. If you want that kind of hit, there's a dozen other guys on a dozen other sites that you can go have that from. That ain't Seeking me. Seeking arrangements. Seeking arrangements or anything else, right? But if you want this kind of experience, I'm down to give you this. Mm-hmm. Right, because I'm going to get as much out of it from as you are. That's a more equal exchange. That makes sense, right? And then as you start realizing, like, okay, it's not just this attraction thing. There's other things going on for her besides that. As she starts showing more interest, as she starts committing more, as she starts investing more, okay, now I can invest more. Mm -hmm. And we can spend more time together doing other things, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, yeah, come over, spend the night. Let's hang out and watch movies and cook together and stuff like that. Let's go to the lake and hang out all day. Let's go fuck, let's go get you some fucking fuzzy socks because they're comfy. Yeah. I don't care, right? Like, why the fuck not, right? It's fine. As long as the investment is there on her part, as long mm-hmm. as it's not a transactional thing it's where like I'm having to give more. Yeah, it's like I mean, a friendship. Yeah, it's it's called dating. Yeah. I know it's weird. This really strange concept called dating where you're like actually trying to build something together. It's mm-hmm. bizarre, but it happens, right? But it happens because she's already decided that you're the kind of man she wants to spend time with because of who you are. Mm-hmm not because of what you do for her. Mm-hmm. That has to be a premise. You cannot be doing it because of the things that you do for her. It mm-hmm. has to be because of who you are with her. And right? the only re- way she's going to like you for who you are is if you keep the the personas to a minimum. Yeah, you have to actually be genuine and, and say, this is this is who I am. Yeah. Right? Now... And understand I, she might not like that. Absolutely. I, don't like, I, am, I don't like to go to a bar. I like to go get bubble tea with a girl because I don't drink and it's weird for me to be at a bar and not drink. And so I bring girls to bubble tea, and sometimes girls are like, I don't like bubble tea. I'm like, well, I can go for coffee. And she's like, let's get a drink. I'm like, no. And then she's like, well, I don't want to see you. I'm like, cool. cool. There's like 50 other girls I will. Good. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the thing is like, I am not, I'm an acquired taste. I'm not normal. Like, I'm just, sure. I'm not freaking normal, right? If somebody wants me to be like vanilla, like that's never going to happen. If somebody wants to be, mono- me, you know, if somebody wants me to be like sexually monogamous, like I don't see that ever really happening. Like there's some things like, nope, 
right? Mm. I play with people's heads for a living. Mm. You've got to be able to deal with that, right? <laughs> if you want me to like not comment on the shit you're doing, it's like mm, that's gonna be really hard for me, yep. right? Yeah, it's like, same. That's the thing for me. I that's can't not. I people. can't not do it. I can't like that part of my brain that's like, oh, I see this thing you're doing. It's like ah, I have to bite my tongue. I can only do it for so long, and it's gonna be that. It's gonna yeah. come out anyways. And you have to be prepared for that. If that's not something you have for, yeah. cool. If you're the kind of person that wants to go to the clubs all the time and go drinking all the time, like I ain't about it. Mm-hmm. Not about it. You know, if you're the kind of person that goes shopping all the time and you're on Instagram all the time, like I'm not about it. That's not my vibe. Mm-hmm. Go find somebody who's going to be more compatible with that because that ain't me, yeah. right? And does that mean that I miss out on you know relationships short or long term? Does that mean I miss out on opportunities? Absolutely, freaking literally. But it also means that the opportunities I do get are much higher quality and much better experiences. Mm-hmm. You know, one of the things that I've realized for myself is I've always kind of been a relationship guy. I always prefer to be able to go deep rather than broad. Mm-hmm. Um, I need my variety. I'm not going to say that's not going to happen, but I like being able to go deep. And what I've realized is that with all the things that I have in terms of BDSM skills, in terms of hypnosis, in terms of getting into Tantra and all that sort of stuff, like there's a lot of things you can really only do if you built up enough trust with someone. Yeah. Yeah. Like sure. you're not in general, you're not gonna tie somebody up and spank them on the first fucking date. If they let you do that, it's probably a red flag. <laughs> <laughs> probably gonna be fun, also probably a red flag, right? There's things that you have to build trust enough to be able to experience together. Mm-hmm. And that's not something you can do after just one or two or three dates. Mm-hmm. And I'd rather have that kind of experience, even if it takes me longer to build to than a dozen one night stands. Mm-hmm. You know, I've got enough notches under my belt that that's not an ego thing for me anymore. I don't have shit Same. to prove to anymore. Yeah. You know, and I realized kind of like the quality of experiences I was getting in those kinds of encounters versus what I can have when I'm able to go deep with somebody. So if it means it's like okay, cool. So I'm not going to get anybody new for a couple of months. Okay, mm-hmm. I'm more than happy to wait for filet mignon instead of having Taco Bell. And we talked about that, right? Yeah. Rather have filet mignon than Taco Bell. If that means I have to wait a couple weeks to have that filet mignon, okay, I'm okay with that trade, right? Mm-hmm. And of course, not everybody's there. Not everybody wants that. Nobody, you know, there's some people who are adamantly against, like, I don't need somebody in my life taking up that kind of space. It's like, cool. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, by all means. I don't think there's anything wrong with going and getting much of one night stands. No, no, not at all. Not at all. And I think that for a lot of guys, yeah, well, for a lot of guys, I think they kind of have to go through that phase yes. to prove to themselves that sex is something that they will never have to go without. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm at the point, it's like, if, if my girlfriend and I break up, okay, it's going to suck. It's going to be painful. There's going to be some healing I got to do, right? Like, I've... I've invested her. She's important to me. Um, but I also know that a couple months from now, I'm going to have another one. Mm-hmm. If I want to go find somebody new to have sex with, like a couple weeks, I'm going to find somebody new. Yep. Probably less, right? It's a matter of like how much time and effort do I want to put into it and what am I willing to like settle for in the meantime. But mm-hmm. I'm going to find something. That's going to be good. It's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be different, right? But I'm not, you know, who is it? Caleb Jones, uh, Black Dragon. He had this... Uh, I know of him. Great, great analogy of like there's guys who are like thrill the hunt guys, mm-hmm. and some guys that are just like pleasure of sex guys, right? Mm-hmm. Thrill the hunt guys, they they love the chase, yep. they love the they, that's just that's just crack to them, and those guys are always going to be out chasing. Yeah, you know, that's that's just what they love to do, and that's what they're built for, and that's what they get the most satisfaction out of. I'm more of a pleasure of sex guy. I want to go deep, mm-hmm. and that's just what gives me more satisfaction. That's a really good way to you say. Know? it. I've been saying it, and like I I've been saying the same thing in like more words that because sure. there's. There's a, a video I put out recently um, that you guys have probably seen. If you haven't, go check it out. It's, um, I think I call it the, the math equation that will get you late. Sure. And essentially, I just break down Tinder as if it's a sales um, yeah. pitch. It's like, well, leads and then conversions and then like dates and numbers, et cetera. Yep. Um, check it out if you haven't. But basically what I'm saying is like, if you work on, if text game is your main thing, then you're optimizing specifically for conversions from text to dates. Yes. But the way I like to do things is um, I just want to find the girls who already want to go on dates. And so my texts are like, hey, like, are you free th- Saturday? It's yes. not, I don't, try, I don't try to build that excitement. If they want to see me, they do. If they don't, they don't. And I, I get a lot less conversions than somebody like Alex from Playing With Fire, sure. who I actually have some articles on his website, yeah. and we've done some collaborations. He's an awesome guy. But he's definitely a uh, thrill to chase guy. Yeah. He 100% loves the chase. Yeah. And there are, a, and I have other friends, I have, there are a lot of guys who love the chase and that's what they love. And I think if you like the chase, then chase. Yeah. But if you 100%. don't like the chase, I think you can have more than enough success in your life by not chasing. Yeah. And I think that there's, 
guys are naturally competitive. Mm. We naturally form hierarchies. Yep. And we naturally have some way to measure like who's on top and who's on bottom, right? And so when you get in the space, you start looking at dating as a like actual pursuit. Like mm. actually it's like, this. I'm gonna figure out how to make this thing happen. Mm. It's very easy for those hierarchies to start forming around say, okay, how many have you been with? Mm-hmm. How hot are they? How quick can you get them there? Mm-hmm. How little effort do you have to do to get them there, right? It's like, oh yeah, I just had the supermodel come back to my place after one cup of coffee that I tasted around 10 years, like three minutes. Mm-hmm. It's like, all right, well done. And that's not a bad way to start looking at things of like, okay, this is what's possible, Mm -hmm. right? Um, But using that as like, okay, this is the standard by which I should judge Mm -hmm. my own progress Mm -hmm. or my own results. That's where I think things get kind of twisted. It's like, Mm -hmm. I don't have to be that guy. I don't have to do that Mm -hmm. because I'm not trying to live that life. Mm -hmm. I don't want his results. I want to do this. But this guy's obviously figured, like, this part of where, where I got into John's group in the beginning back in 2019, uh, John from Modern Life Dating, is like, okay, he's brash. <laughs> he is over the top. Bit of a jerk. Charismatic as hell, like, flashy as hell. Like, he, he's not me in any way, but he knows his shit. Mm-hmm. It is very clear that he knew how to get someone out to a date and get them from the date back to his, to, mm-hmm. to his place to have some fun. I'm like, I don't know how the hell you're doing it, but you've obviously figured this out. So I'm going to figure out how you do your thing mm-hmm. so I can figure out how to make it work for me. Yep. Right. Yeah. And so as you're gamifying these things, it's easy to get caught up in the, oh, the number of notches or how mm-hmm. quickly you got it or the freaky thing you got to do or she's making me sandwiches afterwards or whatever it happens to be. And those are interesting measures of progress. They're externally verifiable, quantifiable mm-hmm. measures of progress. It says, yes, you're better today than you were yesterday. Mm-hmm. The trap is whenever you start using other people's measures of success to judge your own progress, when that progress doesn't actually take you to the goal you want to pursue, Mm -hmm. right? Me going out and having a bunch of one night stands doesn't get me the depth of relationship that I want. It doesn't. So me trying to live that life and go down that road and play that game doesn't get me the results I actually want. I can get really good at it. I can spend years becoming a phenomenal day game guy and having like a hundred and a hundred, you know, a couple hundred lays. But if that's not what I want. It's wasted freaking effort. Mm-hmm. Are there skills in this space that I need to learn in order to get to here? Yeah, probably. Mm-hmm. Is it a hell of a lot easier to get here if you have plenty of weeds coming in the funnel? Absolutely. Does that mean having phenomenal freaking photos on your dating profile? Yes, it does. Does it mean ha- knowing how to text enough to get them out on a date? Yes, it does. Does it know- mean knowing how to handle that conversation so you can actually get them further? Yes, it does. Do I have to do it all the freaking time to create that kind of volume that these guys run? No, I don't. Mm-hmm. I can be more selective. I can be more patient. I can take my time because the thing that I'm looking for on the back end is different than what they're looking for on the back end. I'm mm-hmm. game. I'm engineering for a different result, so my pathway is going to be different. Mm-hmm. Plenty of stuff I can learn from these guys to plug in to fix these different moments in the pathway, right? Because mm-hmm. if I can't get here because I've got no leads, well understanding how to do cold approach, understanding how to do text game, understanding how tender works, Mm -hmm. understanding how to have good photos, understanding to have, you know, how to get the conversion has to happen so I can fix this initial funnel piece. Mm -hmm. Right. But then I still have to figure out how to drive to my conclusion, Mm -hmm. my desired end result, rather than just do what they're all doing. Because it's your life you're building. Because it's my life you're building. You're not just trying to be a copy of them. I'm not here to be John from my life. I'm not here to be Ryan Stone. I'm not here to be Rich Cooper. I'm here to be Ryan Christensen. Mm -hmm. And Ryan Christensen lives a very fucking different life than you those guys. I'm not normal. I'm not going to live a normal life. I'm not going to live their life, right? I'm going to live my life. But my goal is to figure out how to live my life the way I want to and actually act- have it be a life that I want to live. That's worth fucking living. That sure. makes me fucking happy and fulfilled. That gives me, you know, all the acceptance and love and, you know, affirmation and all that sort of stuff where I get to have an impact on the I, world. Yeah. All that stuff. I want all of it, Right. But I can't have all of it if I'm pretending to be somebody else. Yeah. If I'm running somebody else's game, it's like, oh, if you run these funnels, you will have a $100 million business. It's like, I don't want that. I want this. Yeah. So it doesn't make sense for me to do that. Am I going to steal this piece so I can make this? Absolutely. Yeah. But I'm not going to run that plan to its completion. It's like if you have a house, it's every now and then you have to fix your plumbing, but you don't have to become a plumber. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. You have to know enough to know how to fix the thing or who to call to yeah. fix it for you. <laughs> That's yeah. always, it's like, ah, oh, just fix this thing for me. Yeah. It's like, made that happen. Cool. And then I'm off, right? Yeah. You know, like, 
part of the reason why I'm working with Gary is so that I can fix the whole marketing thing because he does direct response marketing. Nice. So it's like, hey, help me figure out how to do this thing. So I don't have to spend six months to a year figuring out how to do this well. Yeah, like, I had a guy work on my website. My yeah. website. I mean, I did a lot of changes. He's actually kind of new to the website thing, yeah. but he did a really good job for being yeah. new. Um, I changed up a lot of stuff on the website, but like he gave me the foundation. I was like, I wouldn't have been able to make that at all. Oh. And you'd be wasting your time trying to figure yeah. it out because yeah, yeah. your talents lie somewhere else. Mm-hmm. Right, I want to do as little. There's a one of the things that Caleb Jones was talking about in this uh, business mentoring group he's got that I'm in right now. Is I, uh, um, I, I know a guy who did some collaborations with him. Yeah, yeah. So he's uh, he's talking about like improvement work versus standard work, right? Like improvement work is the stuff that actually moves the ball forward. Mm-hmm. Standard work is what you have to do to kind of keep things running, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And you want to be spending as much time as you can on improvement work on the stuff that only you can really do, where you add the most possible value for the unit of time. Mm-hmm. Which means you want to be delegating as much of the other shit as possible. Yeah. Right? So if my improvement work when it comes to relationships is like building that foundation over time and building that depth and building that trust, like mm-hmm. that's where I need to be spending my time, not on fucking around on 10 or 7 hours a day. Yeah. Right? I need to outsource that enough as possible. It's like, okay, make this thing good. Help me get these things quick. Good. I've got the good leads. Awesome. Now I'm going to go focus on what I can actually do it's, best. Uh, we met because he worked with me on this photos. Yes. Oh, he's got great foot. He's got a great eye. Great eye. <laughs> Appreciate um, it. Yeah, definitely. Like, and that's one of the things is like a lot of people don't understand about the dating game and the online game in general. It's like there's a process even to get the match on a date or even a match on Tinder. You know, you they're only seeing your photographs yep. first. That's all they have. So that's all they have. Like, no, no woman actually reads your freaking profile description until after you've matched. Mm-hmm. If she even bothers to do it, then right. Yeah. So the only thing you right, have. Sorry. Yeah, the only thing you have is those photographs. So yeah. those have to pop and they have to be, you have to know how to market yourself through those photographs well enough mm-hmm. to attract the attention of the people who you want in, to actually match with you, right? So if I'm throwing up a bunch of stuff about Lambos and yachts, I want to be attracting a bunch of gold diggers mm-hmm. that want a party, mm-hmm. right? But if that ain't me, then I'm not actually getting the leads that I want. It's probably going to turn off the kind of people that I actually want to be around. So if I show me doing the cool shit that I do in a way that they can understand, some meditating, like doing stuff. some tantra stuff, right? Making some cocktails, having some cigars, right? Out having some drinks with friends, mm-hmm. just walking around Austin, right? Then that's going to convey the people who are actually in tune with that are going to say, oh, that's the kind of guy I want to be around. Mm-hmm. That's the kind of guy that's doing stuff I want. It's like that's genuine, which makes the quality of my leads are much higher, mm-hmm. which makes this whole job over here so much easier. Right, so if I do some work here to make this run well, by talking to people I should know how to do this shit right, mm-hmm. I make all the stuff that I want to do so much easier because I'm actually getting quality leads in the funnel. Mm-hmm. Rather than just large number of leads, I'm actually getting quality leads that are qualified to do the thing that I want to do with them in the long run. Mm-hmm. You know? yeah. But it's a very different way of looking at dating and looking at apps and everything else. Yeah. It's, it's like, hey, what, what result am I trying to engineer for? Mm-hmm. A lot of guys, when they're coming in the space, is like, hey, I'm engineering for like not being celibate. Mm-hmm. That's my threshold. Cool. There's a lot of solutions, solutions that are going to get you to like not yeah. being celibate, right? And as you start to realize, as you start to get good at it, it's like, okay, that's not my problem anymore. Now I have this new problem. Yeah, like, proving okay, myself. Like, proving myself here. Yeah. It's like, now I need to up my quality. Now I need to have girls that are actually on my level. Now I need to have girls that are actually interested in the shit I want to do. Now I have, need girls that I actually can bring around my family or my business partners or friends without embarrassing me. Like, yeah. whatever it happens or to be. I can trust them. But like, you can trust them. one yeah. girl that I brought around my friends way too soon and they her and somebody else had to say he my friend asked me for permission and i changed my mind and the anyway, point of point of what it was like it was a shit show absolutely absolutely <laughs> you got to be able to trust me and, yeah. and the thing is until you like know that you can't do that right yeah. and if yeah well you do and that's and experience is what you get when you don't get what you want right that's an interesting way to say it you know experience is what you get when you don't get you what you want and unfortunately for me i have way more fucking experience than i would really like to have but that much more of what i want sure. but i've got a lot of experience but one of the things that's nice about having a lot of experience is that you already know all of the mistakes mm-hmm. and all the ways they can go wrong. So mm-hmm. it's much easier to avoid the pitfalls as long as you've learned from it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. As long as you learn from it. Like that's the biggest thing is a lot of people don't actually sit down and take the time to learn the lessons that they need to from the mistakes that they've already made so they mm-hmm. keep on making the same goddamn mistakes over and over again. It's one thing I've really liked recently. I, it's something I knew, I think I heard it somewhere on Hermosa or something. I watched mm-hmm. a lot of Hermosa recently. Yep. Shout out the interview with you if you want. Yeah, the, the time in your time day, day. do a Zoom interview, or I don't know if I have to, you'll pay for it or whatever. Um, and, but he said something like, 
the pain, like when you get rejected or have a loss, like mm-hmm. the pain is what rem- reminds you of the lesson. And yeah, so I've been grateful for the pain recently because it's that's some like it's harder to learn from other people's mistakes unless they have a very unless they put their emotions into the way they tell yes. you. Because it's the emotions that remind you to not do a thing. Yeah, and I think that the way that a lot of people look at trauma to me, I I, I don't really like the trauma model that most people use, and I'm probably gonna piss off a lot of people. Uh, because I think that you're right. I think that the reason you hold on to the emotional pain is to retain the lesson mm. and to give your unconscious mind a tool to beat you with to get you to not mm. do the stupid thing you're going to do again. Right? right. Otherwise, you get all analytical about it. Is this the thing? Is that the yeah. thing? And it's all in your mind when it, it should be like but an instinctual. Like, yeah, but here's the thing. Like, if you could just keep the lesson and let the emotional content go because you've learned the damn lesson, you know how yeah. to do it right, then you don't have to beat yourself up with that negative emotional content anymore. True. So for me... You know, one of the things that I do in my sessions is give people tools like, okay, you've done all this crap, you've had all these mistakes, there's all this pain, cool. Let's just take the lessons that you need mm-hmm. to retain. Let's just take that bit of information that you need to actually need to hold on to and let go of the rest of the crap. So you don't have to beat yourself up with all that negative stuff. So you're not carrying around as much baggage anymore, right? Because the only reason to keep the pain is to give away to reinforce a lesson. Mm-hmm. But if you've internalized a lesson, then there's no reason to keep the pain. Mm-hmm. Which means you now have more space and freedom to do what you want to do, yeah. right? Yeah. And a lot of ways I look at it is kind of like um, Neo dodging bullets in the Matrix, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. If you've got a lot of baggage and there's all this stuff coming at you and all you can do is like freaking play dodgeball all the time, mm-hmm. you know, dodging all these negative emotions, dodging all these negative thoughts, like trying to turn down the volume, trying to like not do the thing that's per- the, that your mind is telling you to do, you're wasting a lot of time and energy. Like that is a lot of work. Mm-hmm. And the worst part about it is it doesn't matter how long you try, you know, or how did you try, you keep going long enough, you're going to get hit. You're still going to eat one in the face. Mm-hmm. So it doesn't even really work. <laughs> Do all this work, you kind of get by for a while, get smacked in the face anyway, mm-hmm. still sucks, doesn't yeah. actually solve the problem, right? It's like, okay, well, what if you, like, don't shoot yourself with a fuckload of bullets all the time, mm-hmm. right? What if you remove the need to throw all that crap in your face in the first place? Oh, no. I, I heard a thing that sounded like the, the sound when it stops recording and it's Got like, it. ah, yeah. No, but so if you remove the need to throw a bunch of stuff in your face to get mm-hmm. you to do stuff, if all you have is the lessons, it's not necessary to beat yourself and that's okay, now you should stop dodging bullets because there's not a bunch of bullets coming your way. Yeah. That's a lot more effort you have, you're not doing anymore, which means there's a lot more mental space and capacity that you have to do other stuff, right? If you're spending a quarter of your time dodging bullets, third of your time dodging bullets, and you don't have to dodge bullets anymore, now you have a 50% capacity increase. Mm-hmm. You have 15% more juice to do the shit you want to do, mm-hmm. right? So to me, it's like, okay, let's just figure out why you're shooting yourself <laughs> all the time. Make that not necessary. Mm-hmm. Give you all this fucking juice back. And it's like, now you can go do something else. So uh, in hypnosis, like, yeah. when you when you solve that and try to figure out what it mm-hmm. is, it's like, um, and I know the answer because we've done it. Yes. But what's the difference between that and like talk therapy? So in a lot of ways, all right, so your subconscious mind and your conscious mind are two very different beasts, Okay. And some of the very important things about your subconscious mind are that it doesn't actually, it's all driven by emotion. It's all emotional reasoning. It's not rational thought. It's not logic. It's all emotional reasoning. Sure. Yep. So your subconscious mind, it's all driven by emotional reason, right? So if you've ever gotten into a fight with a girl and she's all pissed off about something, it's like, you don't have to be, you know, it's like, there's no reason to be pissed off at that. You know, let's be logical and reasonable. Does it ever fucking work? No. <laughs> no. Because, you know, Ben Shapiro has that, that saying, like, facts don't care about your feelings. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The flip side is also true. Feelings don't care about your facts. Yeah. You cannot disprove a feeling with logic. It just doesn't freaking work, right? Yeah. So if your subconscious mind is driven entirely by emotional logic and emotional reasoning rather than rational thought, and a lot of the talk therapy you're doing is all about understanding things in a very logical, rational way, well, it just doesn't translate well, right? The other thing is that your unconscious mind is often judging true and false, almost always judges true and false based on what it already believes and what it already feels, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. So if you're insecure and you feel like you're not good enough and you go out and you make a hundred million a year running your business, mm-hmm. well, all that success doesn't match with, I'm not good enough, I'm a piece of shit. So your unconscious mind says, yeah, I'm just gonna ignore that. Mm-hmm. But that one person says something bad about you, that's a hit. <laughs> yeah. We're gonna pay attention to that all day long. Right, because yeah. that is true on an emotional level. So it's hard to make those shifts because it's ignoring all evidence that it's wrong, mm-hmm. right? And it's doing all this emotional. It's unfalsifiable, right? You can't prove it wrong because it's just ignoring any evidence that it's wrong, right? 
And that's assuming you even know what the belief is that you're trying to counter in the first place. Because most guys are very, you know, most of us are completely unaware of what's going on down there in the first place. What the actual things, what the actual narratives and stories are that are going on. So, and that's hard to get to in talk therapy or from the outside looking in. Yeah. Right? One of the reasons why I think psychedelics are a very powerful tool, um, things like mushrooms and LSD and MDMA and Mm. methamphetamine and all that fun stuff, DMT, um, a lot of those things are that it opens the door Mm. and kind of like lets some of that crap come out. So you get a lot of insight into what's actually going on down there. And everybody goes, oh, now I understand. It's like, yes. And now that the door is shut again, you have to figure out how to open the door again to fix it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. unless so you're you like with a therapist in the, in the room moment. doing yeah. the stuff with you, but that's essentially hypnosis. Well, that's that's psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, yeah. which is very much a thing and actually has a lot of amazing impacts. They're doing a lot of really cool stuff with it. Mm-hmm. But the thing with hypnosis is that you can get that same opening of the door mm-hmm. just through hypnosis. Yeah. Right. I can speak to you and guide you through this meditative process to get you nice and relaxed. We can open that door to your unconscious mind. And then instead of like trying to figure out what, it, you know, push the button, roll the dice, something comes out, you don't know what it's going to be. It's like, okay, <laughs> we're here to find this thing. Yeah. Let me go find the answer to this question. Mm. Because your unconscious mind does stuff on purpose. It's doing it for a reason. It has a goal. Mm. So if it's screwing with you, there's a reason for it. And yeah. fundamentally, it's trying to help you. So if you just go down and say, hey, cool, like, trying to help me with this. Uh, can you show me, like, what you're trying to do here? <laughs> can you help me understand, like, why you're doing yeah. this? That'd be really nice. You don't have to try and look for the answer because it's already there. Yeah. As long as it's willing to cooperate with you, as long as it's willing to help you out, it's just going to give you that answer. Mm-hmm. And once you understand the story, then you say, oh, okay, cool. So you're doing it because of this. Awesome. Like, oh, because, you know, your dad never gave you the validation. Awesome. Well, um, dad's an asshole. Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't actually matter anymore. So you don't need his validation. You never freaking did. Yeah. So maybe you can do something different. Yeah. Right. And so it's having that conversation, that negotiation, when that door is still open, you still have that direct access mm-hmm. rather than trying to have to fight your way through that wall when you're conscious again. Yeah, like I, I'd done 10 years of therapy, but and it, it did a lot for me, but yeah. I could have easily done that in a lot less time. Like every yeah. single time I take acid, it's like 10 years of therapy, and, and like yeah. our sessions have been like 10 years of therapy. Exactly. Like a lot of a lot of growth when you don't have to, it, it's almost like, it's almost like when you're, it's like you're driving with the emergency brake on. A yeah. Lot of ways. Yeah. And as soon as you take that break off, they can go do yeah. all kinds of stuff. And another way to look at it, you know, I was talking to, I was listening to one of the interviews one of my clients did, and it's like, you know, you can know things on an intellectual level, but until you actually internalize it, it's not mm-hmm. real. Yeah. Right? And hypnosis in a lot of ways, it gives you one of those tools, gives you a tool to take the stuff that you already know is true on an intellectual level, on a rational level, and internalize it on that emotional level. So it's true on both levels, mm-hmm. in your conscious and your unconscious mind, they're actually in agreement now. And on the same page and working on the same team, mm. going in the same damn direction. Yeah. Right? It's like I use this that metaphor a lot of times about the, the captain and the crew, right? If you are if your conscious mind is the captain of the ship, then your unconscious mind is the crew of that ship from the first mm-hmm. officer on down, right? Like if you decide that I want to walk down to the corner store, you're not consciously thinking left, right, right foot, and you didn't, that's not doing it. It's like you're just like, oh I'm gonna walk down the store, and it's like and the crew makes that happen. Yeah. Right? So if the crew doesn't want to do something, it's really hard to force it, mm. right? And if your crew is mutinying, it's like you can beat them a bit and kind of make them do some stuff, but it ain't going to work. Mm, not for not long, long right? Not long term. So what you have to do is that whole leadership thing of like, okay, what the hell is the problem? Mm-hmm. Why are you not cooperating, right? And have that negotiation because the crew that's mutinying feels like they have some legitimate concern or some legitimate yeah. complaint that hasn't been addressed. Right. And they're like, well, we think that those waters that you're getting us going us down have a bunch of sharks in them, and we're, we're gonna all going to die. die. Yeah, exactly. It's like, yeah, I know you want to sail through a hurricane. We think that's a horrible idea. <laughs> We'd rather not do that because we think we're all going to die. Yeah. And it's kind of hard to convince them. It's like, no, we're going to sail. It's like, no, we're not allowed, actually. Even if there's no hurricane. Even if there's they, no they hurricane, think there is. I think there is, right? Or there could be. Like, yeah. it, you never really know. But once you understand what their concerns are, then you can have the discussion to mediate those fears and address those concerns, mm-hmm. right? It's like, oh, okay, well, I think the sharks actually, we've got the special talisman that keeps all the sharks away, so we're good. Right? It's like, yeah. oh, really? Okay, sweet, let's go. <laughs> yeah. right? It's like, no problem anymore, right? But you have to actually figure out why it's doing the things that it's doing, what it's trying to accomplish, how it's trying to help you. And once you have that negotiation, get it on board, now it's going to help you get to where you want to go. Mm-hmm. And instead of fighting yourself the whole time, it's actually helping you go where you want to go. It's you're almost reversing the polarity of that, right? Yeah. So it's somebody dragging you back, it's pushing you forward, you know? And... If you think about all the ways you sabotage yourself and screw yourself up and all that energy that's wasted doing that, so you take all that and so now you don't have the negative, but you add all that on the positive side of scale, like you get a lot of stuff done yeah. really fast. Things shift massively. 
And that's been my experience doing this work in my own life and all the things that are like, I, the amount of crap I've done in the past year is ridiculous. Um, I, my life is unrecognizable now. Mm. I am basically unrecognizable. I was like, man, you've changed so much. It's like, I know, I have no idea how, but I know. <laughs> so I couldn't tell you who I am right now. Get back to you on that one. But I'm definitely not that guy anymore, yeah. right? Um, and it's almost, it's hard for me to conceive of the man that I am right now because I never felt it was really possible to be this. Mm. So there's part of me that's like, wow, like this is my life now. Mm-hmm. Like these are the kinds of things that I'm thinking of. Like this is the thing that I'm building now. It's like, it's mind blowing. Um, and the stuff that I used to have as my goals just feels so small these days. It's like, oh, I want to get it late. It's like, no, I want this, mm-hmm. right? Let me go ahead and just like, you know, sex magic with a high priestess. And like, that sounds like a good idea for Tuesday afternoon. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, oh, I want to like have a business where I can pay the bills. And I was like, no, let me go ahead and like, build this thing instead Mm -hmm. right let me go ahead and work on this level with these kinds of clients let me go ahead and start teaching people how to do my methodology and change the entire field of personal self-development and stuff like that it's like that seems more fun Mm -hmm. let me do that one that sounds like a much bigger goal Mm -hmm. that sounds like more fun it's like sure i can make you know 10 grand a month or i could do that that sounds much more exciting i'm gonna go do that one right Mm -hmm. and that's all because instead of fighting myself now i'm now on my side and instead of being in survival mode i get to thrive Mm -hmm. right so I can pick my head up and look at those bigger goals and help myself get there. Mm. And it's it's amazing. It's amazing. It sounds awesome. Yeah, it's pretty freaking cool. <laughs> um, I think it's a great place to stop. This has been, at this point, I think like an hour. A little over an hour. A half, little yeah. over an hour. An uh, hour and like 15 minutes. Like yeah, something like that. Minutes. Um, this probably will be the last time that you see Ryan. Um, mm-hmm. Where can people find out more about you? So my website is hypnosisformen.com. You can also find me on Instagram and Twitter, Hypnosis for Men. Uh, I've got a YouTube channel, Hypnosis for Men, as well. I've got a number of videos there, a couple other interviews that I've done as well with other guys in the Red Pill space. Uh, feel free to check me out. Um, on my website, there's a button you can use to book a consultation. It's free, 45 minutes. Talk about whatever you're looking to improve or change in your life, and I can see how I can help you. All right. There you go. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure. Appreciate sure. it.